Revelation chapter number 20. <clears throat> Begin reading. I'll... Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible said, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold upon the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loose for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon his foreheads, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first res resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, this portion of eschatology is referred to the millennial reign of Christ. We know that it was prophesied that a woman which had not known a man would conceive and bear a son, and that that son would be the king of Israel, that he would sit upon the throne of his ancestor David, and that he would reign God's people in peace. This portion of Scripture is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Christ certainly, as many people in his day thought that he would, could have raised the throne of David out of antiquity or destruction could have sat down upon it could have established the nation of Israel but he did not come as the Messiah he came as the Christ it is in chapter number 20 in these verses that we get a glimpse of the millennial reign of Christ what's it going to entail it's going to entail a thousand years that's what millennial means the world has been chasing an empire that would last for a thousand years Right? It's what the Nazis desired when they called it the Third Reich or the Third Great Empire. Right? It is what man has used to establish a great legacy or a great kingdom. Right? A very powerful nation and a powerful people. Okay? But Christ does it with no effort. He just sits down for a thousand years and he reigns. But in verse number one, first we see the removal of of our adversary it says I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand let's stop there did not Jesus say that when he rose from the dead that he had the keys to death and hell God's always had the key to hell the devil thought he had the key to death and then Christ went down and took it from him right? but Christ is not the one that shows up with the key it just says an angel Right? Jesus stole the devil's keys and then just left them in somewhere in heaven. And one day an angel's going to pick it up and cast the devil back into the bottomless pit. Right? Christ doesn't even have to personally bind Satan. Right? Satan has no power before God. Right? The Bible tells us that when Michael the archangel contested with Satan for the body of Moses, he said... Didn't bring railing accusation against thee. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. Right? An archangel, more than a match for the devil, when God says the devil has to do something. Right? The devil has no choice. The only power that he uses and exercises right now is because God permits it to happen. Right? The devil is no match for you if God is on your side. Is it any wonder that the scriptures teach that if God be for us, who can be against us? Right? It did not take God Almighty Jehovah to come down and bind Satan. No, any old angel can do it. Right? And that angel was able to carry the key to hell itself. It does not take an act of God or God stepping off his throne in heaven to come down and cast Satan into the bottomless pit. Any angel can do it. Right? If God commanded you to do it, you'd have the power to do it. 
Right? The picture that we get in verse number 1 is that the devil really has no power. That's his greatest deception, is that he has lied to generations upon generations that he's the one that truly can give them the power to become what they ought to be when he has no power of his own. But then it says in verse number 2 that that angel who came down with a great chain and a key to the bottomless pit says he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, we get four titles, if you will, for Lucifer that used to be the minister of music in heaven. Right? We can go to the book of Isaiah and see where he raised up and rebelled against God and a third of the other angels in heaven with him and that they were cast out of heaven. Right? It, book of Revelation refers to them as the stars that were cast down out of heaven. Right? That's why hell was created as a domain to inflict, inflict eternal punishment upon supernatural beings, angels. Satan has always had a home, it's hell. And he, he's always had a final destination, which is the lake of fire. He knows that. And he, wanting the approval and the affection of the Lord God Almighty, was rejected when he tried to usurp his throne above the Lord's. And from that moment forward, anyone that finds favor with God, he hates them. He is your enemy. Because through the grace of God, through the mercy of God, through the long-suffering of God, through the sacrifice of God's only begotten Son, you are able to attain something that He never could. You are a joint heir with Christ. You know, that means your throne in glory is the same one that He sits on. We'll get to it here in a little bit, but there's coming a day when we shall sit on the throne with Him in glory. He doesn't get up and give it to us, but He lets us sit on it for a little bit. Why? Because He bought you so that you could have what He had. That's why we get some of these names in verse number 2. First, the dragon. Throughout the book of Revelation, He's referred to as the dragon. But then it says, that old serpent, letting you know that He's the one that over in Genesis chapter number 3, beguiled the woman. That she would believe a lie that she ate of the tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and then gave to her husband, and he did eat. Right? He's the one that started the lie that you shall not surely die if you sin, if you disobey God. He knew it was a lie. Why? Because he knew that he had a home in hell, and his future was the bottom or the lake of fire. He knew that death awaited him, but he said, you shall not surely die. He's that old serpent. And it says, which is the devil. Right? And Satan. The word Satan means adversary, enemy. Right? The devil doesn't wear a red suit and he doesn't have horns and a pitchfork. Okay? He does have a mighty roar. Right? I mean, after all... The book of Revelation calls him a dragon. He looks intimidating. Right? Compared to flesh, he was originally made as the highest angel in all of glory. He has power. Lucifer, in Latin, means light bringer. Right? It was his job to make heaven pleasant with the music that led the praise and worship unto God. Right? It was his job to shine a light upon who? Christ. But yet he tried to turn the spotlight onto himself. That's when he became the devil. Right? There's no chess match. God didn't make him the devil. He chose to be. He chose to become Satan, your adversary. He chose to become the serpent in the garden. That beguiled the one. He chose to be the dragon that is prophesied in the book of Revelation. And because of those choices, right, an angel says, laid hold on him. You know what that means? If I've got a hold of something, it can't get away. If I hold something in my hand, it means you can't get it out. As long as I'm holding it, it's not going anywhere. 
So as he lays hold on him, what's that mean? The devil can't run. And after thousands of years of him laying out those snares that we read about in the Bible, right, in the devices of the devil, okay, that are meant to sidetrack and trap and to ensnare the children of God, he gets put in a trap. That great chain, not normal chain, it's great chain. But that chain was in heaven and made for one day and for one use. You know what it was? This day. That once the angel lays a hold on the devil and he can't get away, he binds him. But it says, verse number 3, that he cast him into the bottomless pit. He doesn't even get to walk down with dignity. Right? The book of Job tells us that Satan was walking to and fro up and down in the earth. Right? Looking for some that he might have a reason to go before the throne of God and accuse the brethren. Right? That's one of the things that he's known as, the accuser of the brethren. Right? It says that, you know, Jesus told Peter that the devil has desire to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Okay, he likes to grind the children of God under his thumb to see if what they have inside of them is enough to keep their faith in God strong even when it looks like everything else is going to be destroyed. I mean, his tactics haven't changed. He did the same thing to Job that he desired to do to Peter. But yet, Jesus said he's desired to sift his wheat. But he said, but I have prayed for you. Man, this wasn't anywhere in the original game plan, but you do realize that Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us? Do you realize that Jesus, the Son of God, prays to God the Father for you? Why, that you might have the faith to overcome. That you would trust and obey as Christ trusted and obeyed and fulfill the will of the Father. But see, in this passage, he's cast into the bottom of his feet. He's not walking to and fro anymore up and down in the earth. He doesn't have freedom to do as he pleases in a sin-cursed world. No, Christ has come back and he's about ready to set up order again. The way the things should have been and were intended to be when God made man in the garden. And it says, and shut him up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I know that what it means is, is that he opens the bottomless pit, casts Satan in there, and then closes the lid on it to where he can't get out. But, this is theology according to Brother Jordan, it wouldn't bother me if while they're wrapping him up with that chain, if they wrapped it around his head a couple of times so he couldn't open his mouth either and literally shut him up. Now, imagine all the lies that he's whispered to people throughout the ages. Imagine all the things that he promised and never told people about what the hidden text was, right? The catch. Imagine all the blasphemies that he's spoken against the Lord our God. Imagine all the plans that he's spoken to bring about your death or your destruction. Imagine all the times that he said, well, if they'll just quit, then those that come after them, their friends, their children, their grandchildren, I'll be able to have them and take them to hell with me. He's finally shut up. Then, it says, set a seal upon him. You know what that means? Not only is he shut up, there's nothing that he, any of the imps in hell, there's something, not even God himself, if he wanted to, could have made the decision to change it. Because it was the will of God that that seal should be there for a thousand years. That God's will isn't going to change. It's already been told. But it can't be undone. Right? A seal is called a seal because no matter what's going on around it, the seal stays. It's not broken. The only way to undo a seal is to break it. You can't weaken a seal. Right? You can't manipulate a seal. It's either sealed or it's not sealed. And it says this seal is placed upon him. It means he can't even squirm. He's stuck in whatever position he lands 
when they throw them off into hell. It says, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. How long is he bound? How long is he helpless before an almighty God? Well, he's always helpless before God. But how long does God render him without power? For a thousand years. It says, and then he shall be loose, but don't worry, it's only for a little season. He's not going to be able to do again what he turned the world into. Instead, God looses him for a purpose just for a little season. Then it says, verse number four, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Well, who's they? Right, well, skip down about a half a sentence, and it says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Who's that? That's the group that came back with them on the white horses that we read about in our last chapter. That's the redeemed. That's the blood-bought. That's the bride of Christ. It says at the beginning of the verse, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Those that have been washed in the blood now, and those that through the great tribulation will reject the beast and shall die a martyr's death and shall be given their place in the bride of Christ. Those people get their own throne. It says they sat upon thrones, plural. Christ is going to sit down on the throne of David. But if you're in the family of God today, you've got a throne too during the millennial reign. If we were to go across the Bible and to cross-study about Christ's millennial reign, He comes and He sets up His kingdom. He doesn't revitalize right, the kingdom of Israel. No, this is the kingdom of Christ. What Christ brings back with Him is from heaven. It's not tainted by things on the earth. He sets up His kingdom. And now keep in mind, the chapter before this was the battle of Armageddon. There were the 144,000 of the nation of Israel that were saved, delivered out of the hand of the enemy, the Antichrist and the prophet. Well, what are they doing during the millennial reign? They get to live. Death is taken away for a thousand years. Right? We're going to have somebody that's eventually going to be older than Methuselah was. Because right, whoever started in the millennial reign, I assume that they weren't born on the day that it started. Right, one of them, 144,000, all of them, are going to end up being older than 1,000 years old. But they're going to have children, and their children are going to have children, and so on and so on and so on. I've done the math. It ends up being a whole bunch of people over 1,000 years. Right, even at the most conservative estimates. Why do you think that the bride of Christ has thrones, plural, that we may judge as Christ has instructed us to judge? Because there's going to be a whole lot of people. You know what the job of the saints is going to be during the millennial reign? The same thing that we were supposed to do during this life. We were supposed to tell the world what thus saith the Lord. We were supposed to be a light or a symbol of Christ so that others around us would know what it takes to find favor in the eyes of God. When it says that they shall exercise judgment, it's not their own judgment. Their judgment is what, saith, or what thus saith the Lord. God's standards during the millennial reign isn't different than what they've always been. It's holiness. Except during this thousand years, Christ comes back and there's no sin. Christ comes back and the wolf will lay down with the lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah sits upon the throne and everything upon earth is well. It's good. It's pleasant. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. You know what your job's going to be if you're saved today during the millennial reign? You're going to be an extension of God's authority to maintain a sinlessness, holiness, and peacefulness 
upon the earth. Now, caveat, you say, there's thrones, plural. Yep. And in the eyes of God, a throne is a throne. Your throne's not going to be made with any less quality than the one that Christ has. But where that throne is located and how much you are trusted with to judge over during the millennial reign depends upon your faithfulness now. One of your rewards for your service and your faithfulness to the Lord now is your position during the millennial reign. Some were shown to be faithful with much during their fleshly life and they will be entrusted with much during the millennial reign. Others will be like that servant in one of Jesus' parables that went out and received a talent from his master, buried it, and then when the master came back expecting to see a return on his investment, all he had was what he started with. He said, you dumb. You could have at least given it to the bank and they could have loaned it out to people and I'd at least gotten interest off of what I had given you. He said, due to your laziness, due to your fearfulness, due to your bad qualities as a steward, you've actually robbed God. You've robbed the master because the master couldn't even get interest off of it because you went and buried it. Those that do the bare minimum will have the bare minimum of responsibility in the millennial reign. Those that yield themselves as a tool to be used of God according only to His will, they're the ones that will be rewarded much. Right? That's the day that we're going to see all the people that you thought were super spiritual, they're going to take a back seat to those that maybe physically couldn't go out and win souls, but they labored on their knees in their prayer closet, grabbing the horns of the altar, yielding themselves as an instrument of God's will, and they'll be rewarded greatly. All those that the world overlooked, all those that the church may have overlooked, Christ will set upon the throne that they rightfully deserve. All the so-called big preachers, right? all those that you would look at and think, well, surely they've been faithful here below. They're going to take a back seat. Does not the Bible say that the last shall be first, the first shall be last? What's going on on that day during the millennial reign? Well, when the thrones are given out, it'll be according to how we were judged, like we talked about many, many chapters ago, the judgment seat of Christ. Based on your account of the deeds that you did in your body and how Christ judged you then, that will determine the throne that you sit upon during the millennial reign. But it says in verse number 5, it says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is that thing that we call the rapture. Right? It's those saints that died during the great tribulation that were before the altar of God in heaven who cried out, How long shall it be that we're not avenged? That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection happens in a little bit we're not going to get to that today but that's when all the dead that have ever died are brought back to stand before an almighty God at the great white throne of judgment during this period the only people that are alive on earth are Christ the saints the bride of Christ and the 144,000 and all of their descendants throughout the millennial reign You say, well, that's not a lot of people compared to all history. I know. But it's just a time. Does not the Bible teach us that a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years with the Lord? In the grand scheme of all eternity, a thousand years is a short time. But for a thousand years, Christ will rule and reign. Earth will be restored to what it always should have been. Right? God's footstool, a pleasant place that God comes to, right, to enjoy His own creation. You do realize that 
when the Bible says that the earth is his footstool, it's not just talking about God so great that he can prop his feet up on the earth, which he is. Right? I'll remind you that God watered the entire earth with just the creases of his hand. All the water on the face of the earth can fit in those little grooves that you see on your hands. Now, he is a great and mighty God, but what is a footstool? A footstool is a symbol of rest and relaxation. Did not God on the seventh day, for our example, rest on the seventh day of creation? When do you find that God would come and walk and talk and fellowship with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day? in that time that it was most restful and relaxful. Earth was meant to be a place of fellowship and enjoyment and relaxation between God and His creation. Why do you think that all creation cries out to sing praise unto God? Because He deserves it. God didn't intend for us to live in a sin-cursed world. God didn't intend for all the thorns of life to come about. Because before sin, there were no thorns. There was no sickness. There was no cancer. There was no dementia or Alzheimer's. There was no body that gave out the older you got. There were no wrinkles. There was no gray hair. Man was made in the image of God himself. He was gifted a soul so that he would have a choice on whether or not to fellowship with God. And God delighted in the fellowship of his creation. Well, during this thousand years that's what things will be returned to make no mistake about it he's going to be sitting on the throne and rule as a king if he says something it goes but man will be able to fellowship with creator again now, I'm not just talking about the saints we get that for all of eternity I'm talking about the 144,000 and their descendants Whenever they look at us, remember this is after we've received those new bodies. When they look at us, they're reminded of Him. Why? Because we've finally been conformed to His image. When they see us, they see Christ. When they fellowship with us, it's because we are Christ-like. It reminds them of the fellowship that they have with the Creator. We are not God, but we are representatives of God. We're ambassadors of Christ during the millennial reign, just like we're supposed to be now. But it says, that the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. Then, in verse number 2, or I'm sorry, verse number 3, it says that he was bound, shut up, cast into hell, had a seal put upon him, right, for a thousand years. And then at the end it says, and after that, he must be loosed for a little season. That little season is in verse number 7. It says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That's as far as we're going to read this week. But at the end of the thousand years, the 144,000, their descendants, the 144,000 proved their faith in God through the time, of great, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the great tribulation. But their descendants have not yet had a choice. All they have ever known is Christ on the throne, no sin, and a perfect world. Did not Adam and Eve have a choice on whether or not to obey God? Did not Lucifer himself have a choice on whether to rebel against God or not? Didn't you have a choice on whether to remain in your sin or accept Christ as your Savior when you were saved? Don't those during the Great Tribulation have the choice on whether to accept the mark of the beast or the number of or his number into their head or into their right hand? Weren't they given a choice? Well, these descendants of the 144,000, they also must be given the opportunity to make a choice. 
And Satan is loosed out of the bottomless pit after a thousand years to do what he has always done. God uses him as an instrument to go about and see who would choose not to follow Christ. I hate to say that not everybody that lives under the judgment and under the rule of an almighty God is going to like it. Why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because this is the second time that it's happened. It's not the first. Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world. And yet Adam and Eve both chose to knowingly disobey God. For a thousand years, the descendants of the 144,000 are going to be taught, this is what thus saith the Lord. As long as you fall in line with what He says, look at what happens. Everything is wonderful. He's altogether lovely. And everything that He touches is wonderful. But there will be those that when given the chance, they'll believe a lie. Now, why does God use Satan to give people a choice? Because the Bible teaches that it's impossible for God to lie and that God is not able to tempt you unto sin. God cannot say, Be ye holy, for I am holy, and then stick a carrot on the end of a stick, that carrot being sin, and tempt you to commit the very thing that He told you not to do. In order to tempt someone to sin, you must know what sin is. God doesn't know what sin is. He's holy. In order to tell somebody how enjoyable sin is, you have to experience that pleasure in sin for a season. It's the worst salesman in the world that's trying to sell you something that he doesn't believe in. God cannot tempt people to sin. God can't even entertain the idea of sinning. He hates it. Because it's the exact opposite of what He is. So God cannot create something that is sinful. Everything that God has ever made and created was perfect. That's what the creation account in Genesis is to show us. That when God did it, He looked at it and He saw that it was good. There was no evil in it. There were no flaws in it. There were no failings in God's creations. God couldn't even create something in order to tempt you. The only those that can tempt are those that have already fallen to temptation. That chose to rebel against God. The only ones that can tell a lie are those that have believed it. Well, who's the father of all lies? The Bible teaches us it's the devil. So God, knowing that he cannot tempt man, knowing that the only people left on the earth right now have no knowledge of sin, it's been erased from us, right? All the memories of sin are gone. We've got a new body like Christ. The descendants of the 144,000, they don't know what sin is. They've been raised in a world where sin doesn't exist. Christ can't do it. Christ bore your sins on Calvary, but He did not become a partaker of them. If He had became a, a participant in sin, He would not have been the Lamb. He bore the weight of your sin. He bore the shame of your sin. When the Bible says that He became sin who knew no sin, that who knew no sin is still true before and after Calvary. Christ does not know what it is to sin. But He became the payment for your sin, which means He bore the punishment for your sin. He became our sin, took it upon Himself, but it still didn't impact His holiness. He still knew no sin. He paid the price and bore the cost of something that He did not understand. We understand that we deserve punishment. We understand feeling guilty because we know what it is to sin. We know what it is for that soul that is in us to echo back to our brain that God said we shouldn't have done that. Every man knows, the Bible teaches, 
that there is a creator. Because we can look around and determine that nothing that was made was made by anything else that we see. What an accident or chance. There's a design or an intelligent design to all of this. There was purpose behind it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that man knows there is a God, even in his soul. Guilt comes from knowing that you're unclean. Christ doesn't know what guilty feels like. He knows what it's like to receive a guilty verdict because he paid for the price of your sin. But all the while, he did not understand at any point what it was to fall short of God's glory because he never did. How could that one create something to tempt somebody else? He can't. He doesn't understand what sin is. But still, not knowing it, he bore the price for us. So that one day we could live in a world, a new heaven and new earth, where there never would be sin ever again. So how could he tempt those people to sin? He can't. He couldn't even create something that would go out and tempt you. So he goes back to the original rebellious one and says, you're unchained for a season, for a short bit. How long? I don't know. It's long enough for him to make his rounds throughout the earth and give everyone the opportunity to either profess their faith in Christ and live by it or to reject Christ and embrace a lie. All of those that are still alive on the earth will have the choice whether to accept Christ as their king and as their Lord and as their Savior or to reject him. It says that he went to the four quarters of the earth. You know what that means? Everywhere. There's not any mistakes in God's plans. There's not somebody that's going to fall through the loops and God's going to say, well, you get in by default because we forgot to let the devil tempt you. No, everyone's going to be confronted with the same choice that you were confronted with. When the Holy Ghost drew you with cords of loving kindness to the cross and showed you the cost of your sin but that you didn't have to pay it because it had already been paid by a loving Savior everyone's going to have that decision just as Adam and Eve did just as you did just as everyone that has ever lived has had that decision but look back with me if you will in verse number 6 this is what we're going to end this week it says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. You remember when I talked about that? The only people that were brought back to life were those that had died in Christ, either before the great tribulation or during the great tribulation. He says, On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be the priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Is it any wonder that the book of Revelation teaches that he hath made us kings and priests? Kings to rule and reign over this flesh. Well, depending on how you rule and reign over your flesh, as a child of God, will depend how you reign during the millennial reign. But it also says that we're blessed because they are the priest of God. You realize what that means? Really, right now we're priests so that we can pray directly to God without an intermediary. We've got a high priest, but his name's Jesus. He's the same one that we pray to. I don't have to go through anybody else to get my prayers to heaven. Hallelujah. But here it says that they shall be, shall be. So it's not talking about the priestly capability you have now to pray to God. It says that during the millennial reign, you shall be priests unto God. Well, first off, during the millennial reign, there will be no need for sacrifices like under the Old Testament. Why? Because there's no sin during the millennial reign. But you know what there will be? There will be offerings. Praise offerings. Offerings of worship. Offering of thanksgiving. Who do you think is going to administer those things? It's going to be those that were the saints of God. 
If someone wants to take a grievance to the Lord, or if they have a question for God, you'll have a body like His, which means you'll have a mind like His, which means you'll know the answer. But you know what your duty will be as a priest? To take that request to the king and then come back and deliver the answer. You're a mouthpiece of God during the millennial reign. But it says that they shall reign with him a thousand years. And blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. If you got any doubt in the fact that I said during the millennial reign, after you receive that white garment at the marriage supper of the Lamb that we talked about in the last chapter, you can't tell the difference between you and Christ. Why? Because blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection. After an entire life down here in the flesh wrestling with this sucker, right after giving an account of the deeds that you did in your body, you are rewarded with a body like His. You know what that means? You finally are holy as God is holy. We know that in this sin-cursed flesh, we cannot be holy. That's why He robed us in His righteousness. We should strive to be holy. We should endeavor to become more like Christ. But we know that we'll never reach it on our own. If that were true, Christ wouldn't have had to die on the cross. But there's coming a day where we finally will be holy. It happens sometimes, be sometime before the millennial reign why because we're holy when we come back with him it's not like he just waves his hand and says alright y'all are holy now no the bride is prepared for the groom the bridegroom Christ what's that preparation that was in our last chapter where he gives those fine linen garments that's a symbol of the fact that she has attained the bride of Christ purity she has been prepared for the bridegroom. She's ready. You know what that means? She's holy. All those that have a part in the first resurrection, when they sit down to rule and reign with Christ throughout all of eternity, you know what you are? You're holy. You know why you're holy? Because He made you holy. You know why He was able to make you holy? Because He applied His blood to your life to pay for your sin. No wonder it says blessed and holy. He doesn't start off with holy. You're going to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, H-O-L-Y. Everything about you is going to be holy. But as holy as you are, you're even more blessed. Blessed that that was even able to take place because of the grace and the love and the long-suffering of God blessed that you didn't have to go through the great tribulation blessed that you were able to know Christ for all of eternity from the moment you get that new body you know nothing of sin forevermore you're blessed that you don't have to one more time be tempted by Satan when he's loosed he can't do nothing to you you've already graduated to the next class you look. How's Satan going to be able to look at somebody that has a body like Christ, looks like Christ, is holy like Christ, and tempt them to sin? He's not going to be able to. That'd be trying to look at Donald Trump and convince him he's Joe Biden. Not going to happen. That'd be like showing somebody the color blue and trying to convince them that it's black. Not going to be possible. We're blessed beyond measure now. Imagine how blessed we're going to feel that day. But you're also blessed because of what else verse number 6 says. It says, On such the second death hath no power. Now that's a passing reference now. But as we get forward, we're going to find out what the second death is. We've already mentioned it several times. That's when you're cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. The Bible says they shall be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Now, a very wise man, I heard it from Brother Greg Phillips. I think he stole it from somebody else. 
But he said, everyone is either born twice and dies once, or they're born once and they die twice. That comes from this verse. Did not Jesus tell Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 that ye must be born again? And he marveled at it and said, How can I as an old man enter into my mother's womb? He said, I'm not talking about being born of water. He says, I'm being, talking about being born of spirit. Right? You'll either be born twice, which is why I say folks a lot of times say that they've been born again. You were born into the flesh, but you were dead spiritually. But if you allow Christ to raise you in newness of life and become the new creature spiritually, you receive the second birth. That's what being saved is. You've been saved from the judgment of God, the punishment of God, the retribution that you would have had to have suffered for your own sin. And because you have that second life, you've received what this verse will call the first resurrection. You are part of that first group that got resurrected. The second group that are brought back, they're the ones that did not accept Christ. They're the ones that have to give an account for their sin. He says those that are in the first resurrection have no part in the second death. Because we've mentioned it several times throughout the book of Revelation, especially when talking about the prophets that God sends back in sackcloth that he gives power unto to prophesy against what the beast is doing. Right? It's appointed unto men how many times to die? Once. And then the judgment. Well, based off of that judgment, it determines if you are appointed for the second death. God never appointed anybody to be condemned to the second death. God only appointed that those that take breath must one day take their last breath because of sin. Once sin entered into man, death entered by sin. All that God ever preordained is that this flesh would have to die because it was cursed by sin. God never predestined anyone to be cast into the lake of fire. It's because of our choice whether to accept or reject Him, like we've already talked about, that determines whether we have a part in the first resurrection or in the second death. But see, everybody that draws breath is going to have to die. Not because of God, but because man chose to sin, and sin was passed upon all generations. It would be unjust of God to keep you in a sin-cursed body for all of eternity because you wouldn't be able to experience the fullness of what God intended for you. If you have a part in the first resurrection, you don't have to hear. As they bring out the books, the book of life, and the book of the records of man's deeds throughout all of eternity, you don't have to experience what it is to flip through those pages and not be able to find your name written down in the Lamb's book of life. You don't have to experience flipping through the books and finding out that what you thought was right and what you were deceived with ended up being a lie. You don't have to go through those books and then hear the judgment or the price of what each one of those sins that you committed was. You have no part in the second death. You have no part in depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. You don't have to be taken hold of by an angel or at the very word of God be cast off into the lake of everlasting fire. The lake of fire and brimstone. The place that even the very soul of someone is tormented and kept in a constant state of what? Death. Never to become alive ever again. They're brought back to life for a moment only to find out that they'll be dead for all of eternity. No wonder it says blessed and holy are they that have a part in the first resurrection. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on daily devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.